In today's Enolate session, we're going to cover aldol addition and Claisen condensation. Yes, we'll cover the reaction and mechanism, but that is only so that you can understand the foundation for the time-saving shortcuts that I am going to show you. When you look at the aldol condensation, it's a bit of a mess of a reaction. And you look at the Claisen condensation, and some people call it an aldol addition reaction, an aldol reaction, it's all kind of the same thing, the aldol reaction and Claisen reaction. Again, a big mess of the reaction. Let me know in the comments if you've been overwhelmed by these reactions, and then give me a thumbs up, give this video a thumbs up, if you want to walk out of this session being able to solve way more difficult problems than what I have on the screen in a matter of seconds, because that is what I'm going to show you today. As a reminder, go to layerforsci.com slash or go live. Just see the pinned comment or the link on the screen to get a copy of tonight's session notes, a link to the recording and a practice worksheet for even more practice. When you look at these two reactions, they're nearly identical. The only difference is the first one I started with an aldehyde could have been a ketone, and the second one is an ester. So notice we have an H versus an OCH3, and that makes the product a little bit different. So I'm going to show you exactly how we get to here. But first we need to understand, so what is actually going on here? It all has to do with the enolate reactivity, the enolate intermediate. Before we talk about the enolate, we need to talk about the enol. If I have a molecule that has, I don't know why I'm drawing a carbonyl, that has an alcohol. And on the same carbon that is holding the alcohol, I also have an alkene. This right here is called an ene for the alkene, an ol for the alcohol, an enol. Now, if you look at my ketoenol to tomorization, you'll notice that the enol is actually very easily able to tautomerize or isomerize to the keto form or an aldehyde, but that's technically called the keto form in terms of tautomerization. This is called KET for ketoenol tautomerization. The keto form is more stable, but the enol form, when we deprotonate it, is how we're going to get the reactivity that we see today. So if this is the enol, what is the enolate? The enolate is very simple. If I take my enol molecule, I'll just do uh, here, let's show it like this, and I show it in this form, I can bring, or actually we can show it in the keto form as well, because technically the intermediate is going to be the same, and the reactions we're going to see today start in the keto form we'll look at one of the hydrogen atoms sticking off the side here. If I bring in a strong base, the base is gonna vary depending on the type of the reaction. We grab the alpha, car the alpha hydrogen, the, technically this is the ground zero, this is the alpha carbon, and the hydrogen sitting on it, that is the alpha hydrogen. When the base grabs that hydrogen, the electrons will collapse, but they won't sit on carbon because that would give us a carbanion, a very, very unstable intermediate. Instead, they're going to go towards the carbonyl carbon because if you remember from resonance, the carbonyl carbon is very partially positive, the carbonyl oxygen is partially negative, and so the electrons are attracted to that carbonyl carbon. Only problem is too many bonds on carbon which is very easily fixed by breaking the pi bond, collapsing those electrons onto oxygen. We already had two lone pairs. And what we get now is a molecule that looks like this. We have one bond to oxygen, two blue pairs of electrons. The third pair in orange that used to be the pi bond gives oxygen a negative charge. And then the electrons that I showed in red over here that used to bond the hydrogen to carbon now sits as a pi bond between the carbon and the former carbonyl carbon. This molecule is able to resonate with the essentially keto form, very similar to ketoenol tautomerization. And so if these electrons resonate down, 
And these electrons resonate here. This is kind of what we thought would happen initially when we grab the hydrogen. And notice that I'm keeping all the colors consistent so that you can follow where everything came from. These electrons are now sitting here as a pi bond and the red electrons have now collapsed onto the carbon. This is what we need to understand for all of the enolate reactions and especially for what we're going to look at today. Technically, the electron started out on carbon. The problem is that carbon is not as electronegative as oxygen and carbon is less stable when it has to hold the negative charge. It's unhappy. Oxygen is more electronegative. That means the oxygen holding the negative charge is more stable. And so the way I think of it is an enolate is a way to park the electrons on the oxygen. Except, and here is something a lot of students get confused, so I want to make sure you're clear on it. Never, ever, ever show the oxygen doing the attack. Even though we park the electrons on oxygen, anytime I initiate a reaction, the electrons will come down. This pi bond will get kicked out. And once it's sitting on here, it will go and attack the next thing that we're attacking for the enolate reactions. And so the key, key takeaway is oxygen is where you park the electrons, but carbon is the attacking atom. So carbon gets its electrons back and says, thank you for holding them for me. It's now my turn. I am going to initiate the attack. So this is all background to make sure that you're with me, that you fully understand. Let me know in the comments if you have any questions. If you do, I want to make sure we clarify them. If you're watching the recording afterwards, let me know in the comments as well. I do try to answer all the YouTube comments. I want to make sure you're crystal clear so that we can go on to the aldol reaction. First, we'll go through the step-by-step -step mechanism. So this is the aldol addition or condensation, whatever your professor calls it, reaction. We'll go through it step by step, then I'm going to show you the shortcut. The aldol comes from alt all. So what kind of molecule are we expecting to see in an aldol reaction? Aldehyde for the ald and alcohol for the all. This is something we're going to see in the product. Enol talks about the type of molecule we're reacting, but aldehyde and alcohol has to do with the product of an aldol condensation. This reaction can happen with an aldehyde or a ketone. By the way, it happens to have the aldehyde name, but it can also happen with a ketone. And we'll start out with the absolute simplest molecule so we can focus on the reaction. Here I have an aldehyde. It has the carbonyl carbon, which is important for parking the electrons, and the alpha carbon. Without an alpha carbon, I cannot initiate an attack. So that is really, really critical. And specifically, I'm looking at the hydrogen sitting on the alpha carbon. I'll bring in a strong base. It can be an OR minus or an OH minus. You'll typically see this with an OH minus. The base will grab the electrons grab the hydrogen, I'm sorry, the base will use its electrons to grab the hydrogen, breaking that bond, but instead of collapsing it onto the carbon, we're going to park the electrons on oxygen. This is what you consider the activation step because now we have an oxygen with three lone pairs, we'll show these in red, a negative charge, remember oxygen is where we park it. We also have a pi bond sitting here for the enolate intermediate. And this right here forms water in solution, which we're going to ignore because I wanna focus on the mechanism. When I have an aldehyde in solution, it's not just one, I have hundreds and thousands and millions. And so the next step is looking at another aldehyde in solution. Remember we said that we only park the electrons well, now that the electrons are parked, we're going to use them. So it will collapse back down to reform that pi bond. And the electrons here, instead of for, uh, going onto carbon, I told you that they actually go onto carbon so that they can go and attack. I'm gonna show it in one step where the entire pi bond electrons reaches out and does a nucleophilic attack, a direct attack on the carbonyl carbon, which once again, creates too many bonds to carbon. And so we'll break these electrons up onto oxygen. 
This is not an enolate, though, because we're not forming a pi bond. Let's clearly follow what we have. For the green structure, we have our two carbons, oxygen with now just two lone pairs, because these electrons, which I'll show in orange, have reformed the pi bond. The red electrons are now sitting as a new bond between the green molecule and the blue molecule. The blue molecule got attacked at the alpha carbon, so now we only have one bond between carbon and oxygen. Two lone pairs that we started with, the purple lone pair that we just added when we broke the pi bond, the negative charge sits on oxygen, and we are good to go. Technically, we're almost done, but we never want to stop with a negative oxygen. And so what do we do to neutralize our product? To show the most stable product, you need something neutral that won't want to continue reacting. And that thing that we're going to use to neutralize the oxygen is water or a mild acid. The fact that I started this in base, you have to specify step one base and then step two is acid because we're going to protonate it with a mild acid, just H3O+, which if I show it like this in solution as something that I just added in, we can show that the oxygen will reach for a hydrogen, give the water's oxygen, the hydronium oxygen back its electrons, because I don't want to redraw this whole thing, let's see what changes here. The only difference is that instead of a pink lone pair on this oxygen, we have a pink bond to the light blue hydrogen, and that's it. We have our neutral product. Notice that in my neutral product, I have an aldehyde and an alcohol. Aldol, aldehyde alcohol. That is where the name for this reaction comes from. Let me know in the comments, are you with me so far on this reaction? Are you comfortable with the mechanism? Maybe not enough that you can repeat it, but comfortable enough that you understand the steps so that with practice, you will be able to repeat it. While you're letting me know that in the comments, notice that I did this reaction in base. NaOH is a base, and base is more common, but you can also do this reaction in acid. Now, I'm not going to go through the entire step-by-step -step mechanism. I just want to show you the main difference between acid and base. If I do this in an acid catalyst, then the first step has to be an activation step, because if I try to do a nucleophilic attack and kick up pi electrons, then the oxygen will be negative. And you never, ever, ever want to form an O minus in an acidic solution because it cannot happen. The acidic solution is immediately going to protonate it or not even allow it to form. But if I first activate the carbonyl, and you see the activation step a lot in acid catalyzed reactions for carbonyls. Now I have a hydrogen on there, one lone pair and a positive charge on oxygen. If I bring in another molecule, an enol, to do the attack, then I'll just show it here. If I bring in another one to attack right there and kick up the pi electrons, I don't have a negative oxygen. I don't have an O minus forming. I have an OH that's neutral. So this is how you would show it in acid. And the rest of the mechanism is pretty much the same in terms of where the electrons come from, what is going to attack, and then ultimately the products. Except actually you don't get an O minus, you have an OH. So the final protonation step doesn't happen in acid because it's already protonated. For the rest of this session, we're just going to talk about it in base because this is most common, the mechanisms are very similar, and you're most likely going to be tested on it in base. If you're with me so far, let me know if you want to know a very, very simple way to come up with these products, because sometimes you're asked to do the mechanism. And in the worksheet that I wrote for tonight's session, I do have quite a few questions where I ask you to do the mechanism, but I also have an entire page of problems where you just want to show the product. And if you just want to show the product, how are you going to do this quickly 
so that you do not have to go through the entire step-by-step -step mechanism. Let me show you. So let me grab the reaction again. This is the product itself. And we'll use this to come up with the step-by-step. -step. But first we have a couple of questions. What base would you use for that? So I'm using NaOH here, but you will often see either an OH or an OR, like CH3O minus, ETO minus, or similar. I've also seen LDA, lithium diisopropyl amine. Ronel, yes, I do plan to cover that soon as well. Actually, let's go back to that. So we have a very good question here. Can you show why adding heat removes the alcohol? If this is my final product, then technically this is not where the molecule is most stable. If you remember, the most stable or more stable than this is if I can have a conjugated system because resonance equals stability. And so if I add heat into the system, heat gives me a high activation, allows me to achieve a high activation energy. So I put in a lot of energy so that my product is a lot more stable. It gives me, if you remember thermodynamic versus kinetic, you put in heat, you do a reaction that takes a lot more energy, but the product is more stable. And what will happen in a reaction where you put in heat if I do this in a base catalyzed reaction, so here we're showing it in acid, but if I did this in base, then I could show, um, I just realized in the worksheet, I left it as H3O plus and heat. So there's two ways I can show this actually, in acid or in base, but let me just show you this one real quick. If I add an H plus from solution, from an H3O plus, that will give me an activation step. And what that will ultimately do is turn the OH into a good leaving group. Because at this point, we are in an acidic solution. We're not in base anymore, and so I cannot form an OH minus. I can also do this in base, by the way, but right now I'm in acid, so I'm gonna show it to you in acid. What'll happen here is I have, one second, I kept too many electrons on here. That should not be there, there we go. And so, Let's show the blue electrons reaching out for it, and that should not be there. That would have been way, way too many electrons. Okay, so now this makes a lot more sense. We have a hydrogen here. We have one lone pair. No, we don't have a lone pair. I know why I keep trying to add a lone pair. If we have no lone pairs, let's try to do some math today, Leah. Zero lone pairs, good leaving group. If I have, not if I have, I do have two hydrogen atoms sitting over here. And I can show a water molecule coming in and grabbing one of them. The electrons won't stay on carbon. There is no way we're forming a C negative in an acidic solution. Instead, these electrons are going to collapse upward in the direction of this group here because oxygen does not like that positive charge and it starts pulling on the electron density between itself and carbon so that these are attracted to the partially positive carbon over here, which ultimately kicks off the water molecule that is desperately trying to leave anyway. And what I get as a result here is I have my first carbonyl with the two lone pairs. I have the red bond, which is what I got from the initial condensation, the initial attack to the blue chain. I now have the purple electrons that came from the hydrogen's electrons being kicked up. And this right here is a conjugated system. The conjugated system is more stable, but it required heat to carry out this reaction. And that is my final product. So even though it doesn't look like an aldol, I have no alcohol, recognize that this does come from an aldol condensation reaction. Ronel, that was a very good question and I hope this clarified it for you and anyone else who was wondering. So let's go and look at the shortcut. I'm gonna do this easy problem first, then we'll try a tricky one to prove to you that it works even for harder problems. The first thing you're going to do, step one, is you're going to number your players. And specifically, we're looking at one, two, and three. We have three players in this game. Carbon number one, carbon number two, and carbon number three as follows. 
Carbon number one is the attacking carbonyl. And, uh, sorry, the attacking carbon on the carbonyl, so that would be this one right here. It's the alpha carbon that does the attack. So let's call it, uh, you know what? No, let's number it this way. I want to make this as simple as possible. Carbon number one is the attacking carbonyl carbon. Carbon number two is going to be the alpha carbon attached to the attacking carbonyl. And so we'll call it the attacking alpha. That's this one. And carbon number three is the carbonyl carbon that gets attacked. Okay, so this is the first step to this trick. You have to know how to number it. One, two, and three. Step number two you're going to draw a V and you want to number the V one, two, and three. So we'll draw a V. Actually, let's get rid of the product so you can see how it comes together. We'll draw a V like this and we're going to number it one, two, and three. Then the third step is you're going to fill in the groups based on what we had in the attacking situation. Fill in the players. And so if you remember, carbon one was the attacking carbonyl carbon. And that means C1 is unchanged. It remained a carbonyl carbon. So let's go up here and see that one is unchanged. It keeps its carbonyl. This is an aldehyde. Carbon two, if you remember, was the attacker. And so what we're going to fill in here, well, is nothing, because C2, just know that it has a new bond. But really, it's do nothing. And then C3, which got attacked, is now gets an OH, because remember, it's a carbonyl that got attacked. And so we'll put an OH right over here. That is if we did the reaction as is. But if we did it in heat, then you get a pi bond between carbons two and carbon three. So if we added heat, as we had a really good question on before, then you don't have the alcohol, you just put a pi bond between carbon two and three. And then last but not least, this is a step that students often forget. Step four is you want to fill in the rest. So let's see what we have here for the rest. We have nothing else on the attacker. We have a methyl group coming out of carbon three on the molecule that gets attacked. And so we get that methyl group here. We can call it A, B, C, D, whatever, if it's a long chain. And that is it. So take a look at the steps one more time and let me know if this is something you feel that with practice you can slowly memorize. Let's see how to do this for an even more complex example. And let's see if I can make this smaller so that you can work the example with me. Don't worry, it sounds like a lot, but let me show you how to make this so fast and so simple that this is going to be a really quick reaction. Brittany, you have a quiz tomorrow. Let's see how you feel about this. If you are told to react a molecule that looks like this, under conditions that will give me a condensation reaction, before learning the shortcut, let me know if you consider this easy, medium, or hard. And if you're watching the recording, let me know in the comments. Easy, medium, or hard. The first thing you're going to do is redraw it. I teach you shortcuts to save time so that when you need to spend time, like right now when we need to redraw, you have that kind of time. You redraw it 
because we have two of them reacting and we're going to number the players. That's step one. And we're going to number them carbon one, the attacking carbonyl, two is the alpha, and three is the carbonyl that gets attacked. So let's see what that looks like. Carbon one is the attacking carbonyl. Carbon two, the attacking alpha. Carbon three, the carbonyl that gets attacked. Step one, complete. Step two, that would be our product. We're going to start by drawing a V. So we'll draw the V right here. Number it one, two, and three. One, two, and three. And now we're going to fill in the groups. Carbon one is unchanged. That is just a carbonyl with a hydrogen. It's an aldehyde. Carbon two, it has a new bond to carbon three. We do nothing unless we're given heat. Then we put a pi bond. And then carbon three gets an OH unless we have heat. Then we put a pi bond. So carbon three is this one. It got attacked. It gets an OH. Step four, we fill in the rest. Coming out of carbon two, I have a cyclohexane. And so coming out of carbon two, I have a cyclohexane. Coming out of carbon three, I have a methyl group with a cyclohexane on it. Don't forget that methyl group. So there's my methyl group, and attached to the methyl, I have a cyclohexane. There we go. I didn't have to do any mechanism. I didn't have to do anything crazy. All I did was follow the steps. If you thought this was easy, medium, or hard, how do you feel seeing the product come together, and do you still think it is as difficult as you thought it would be prior? Let's say we had to use heat in this reaction. So we'll put it as step one, NaOH, step two, H3O plus, and heat. Then the only difference is instead of putting an OH on carbon three, we would put a pi bond between carbon two and three, and everything else is still exactly the same. If you have any questions on this, go ahead and type it in. I want to, in the meantime, show you. Oh, I copied that. Let me grab this because I don't expect you to have it memorized until you spend some time reviewing. But I do want you to be able to follow along with me. Ah, oh, come on. Why isn't it letting me grab it for you? There we go. All right. So let's grab this and let's do another problem as follows. We'll keep this on the side. But this time, I want to show you what happens if you have more than one type of starting molecule. Let's say I'm starting with a ketone, and I'm reacting it with an aldehyde. But this time, we'll make it a little bit unique. So we'll have an aldehyde that looks like this. And we're also going to say that this is in limited quantities. We have very little, and this one is in excess. This is really, really important. So first of all, notice I started with a ketone. It does not have to be just an aldehyde. You can absolutely do this with a ketone as well. If I have two different molecules, they can attack each other or they can attack the other molecule. And so I was very careful with what I chose here because I don't want to have a ton of different reactions happening. If I react this molecule in base, say NaOH as step one, and step two will put in H3O+. If I have very limited quantities, the NaOH is going around looking for a molecule to react with. The problem with this aldehyde. If you think about the first step, we grabbed the hydrogen off of the alpha carbon, but there's no hydrogen. There's no alpha hydrogen here because it's a quaternary carbon. And so the OH minus cannot attack this one. So it keeps looking, it keeps looking, and the only thing it finds is the ketone. The ketone is symmetrical. That means you can attack the right or the left. And it has all these hydrogen atoms which the base is going to go ahead and grab. So this is my attacking molecule. 
because it's the only one that has an alpha hydrogen. That's the first thing to recognize. Then, once I activate this and turn it into an enolate, the reason why it will not attack itself is because there's very little in solution, but there's a ton of this in solution. So chances of a ketone crashing into another ketone is very low. Chances of a ketone crashing into an aldehyde is very high because there's tons and tons of the aldehyde floating around in solution. And that is how we control the product to make sure that this is my attacker and this one gets attacked because of the way I set it up and in terms of the numbers. So professors will expect you to know that. If they don't say limited and excess, just know that if this can attack, it'll attack both itself and this one for two different products. Let's go ahead then and apply the trick to quickly come up with a product. First thing we're going to do is number the players. One is the alpha on my attacking carbon. Uh, sorry. One is the carbonyl on the attacker. Two is the alpha. Three is what I attack. For the product, I draw a V and label it one, two, three. I redraw carbonyl on one. Carbon three with no heat is going to get an alcohol because the carbonyl got attacked. And then I fill in everything else. On the attacking molecule, I have a methyl group coming out of carbon one. So that would be the methyl group right there. On my attacked molecule, I have a tert-butyl group coming out of carbon three. And so that there's my tert-butyl group and this here is my product. If I did not give you limited quantities for this, I'm just going to show this to you over here, very minor, just so you can see how they both work. I start with my V, the attacking molecule, keeps the carbonyl. The one that gets attacked will show it over here. <coughs> one moment, please. <coughs> Sorry, guys. I don't know how to mute on YouTube. So you had to hear that. I apologize. My kiddo has been sick. Pretty sure he's getting me sick. So hopefully that's not going anywhere worse than the cough. All right, so we have this right here, and all we need is a number three here. That is going to get an alcohol over here. And then what else do we have? On the attacker, we have a methyl on carbon one. On the one that got attacked, we have a methyl and a methyl on carbon three, methyl and a methyl, and there you go. That's my final product. This is considered a mixed aldol because we mixed it up. We had two different molecules that reacted, and so we got a potential for many different products. A couple of really good questions. Is the product racemic? If you look at the first product, this one has a chiral carbon. And the reason we know it's chiral is we have three visible unique groups, alcohol, tert-butyl, this thing, and we also have a hydrogen that is not visible, but a fourth unique group. That means it's chiral. But because we started with an achiral carbon, sp2 hybridized trigonal planar or flat, it can get attacked from the top or the bottom. So if you do get a chiral product, it will be racemic, means 50% R and 50% S. This one is achiral because I have two methyl groups, so it's irrelevant. But if it's chiral, yes, it will be racemic. We would only have two stereoisomers, one with the R, one with the S, because there's no other chiral carbon on this molecule. Question, where is the alpha hydrogen in the gets attacked molecule? The alpha hydrogen on three for the first one is invisible. So it would just be right there, but we're not going to show it because hydrogen in line structure doesn't have to be shown. I show it in an aldehyde just to make it obvious that this is the aldehyde functional group. Oops, did not mean to do that. All right, so now that you've seen the trick again, what do you think? Is this going to save you time on your next quiz or exam? Let me know in the comments as we move on to the next reaction, and that is the Claisen condensation. 
which sounds like it wants to be a whole separate fancy reaction, I am going to challenge you to recognize that it's pretty much the same reaction with nearly the same trick. It just uses a different functional group. So let's see what the difference is. Well, first, let's look at an overview of the reaction. And for this reaction, you'll notice that I started with a very similar molecule, except instead of a hydrogen for an aldehyde, I gave you a methyl ester reacting with another methyl ester. And the product is a beta keto ester. If this is my ester carbonyl, then alpha and beta is this one. And I have a ketone beta to my ester, beta keto ester. That is the main difference between the aldol and Claisen reaction. So let's look at the mechanism and prove that it's pretty much the same exact thing. We'll start with we'll start with the ester. And one of the differences is that you want to react this not with NaOH. You want to use a base that has the same OR group as the ester. Otherwise, you're going to get a transesterification reaction which is not something that you want to see here. So let's not draw that whole thing out. We'll just show how this is going to react. Let's take a look at the alpha hydrogen because that's the one I'm going to grab. And we'll begin the mechanism when the CH3O- grabs the hydrogen, collapses the electrons towards the carbonyl, kicks up those electrons to form the enolate exactly as we had before. So now we have an O-. We have the OCH3 here hasn't moved. We have these electrons now sitting as a pi bond. And let's show these in blue sitting over here. And then somewhere off in solution, we have a CH3OH, whatever. We're not going to worry about it. We're reacting it with another ester molecule. In this case, I'm choosing to use the exact same, but you can also have a cross claisen where you use a different one. Exactly as before, and I probably should have flipped it when I drew it, no, it's fine. You can follow along carefully. Here we go. So the blue pi electrons come down. These electrons will come out, sit on the carbon, and then from the carbon, they're going to attack. But I'm going to show it in one step like this. And that will kick up the pi electrons. Do you notice that it's exactly the same reaction that I had before? Exactly the same. I am going to flip this one around though because I think it'll look less messy. So I'll draw the CH3O on this side. And then that's my starting molecule. I have the oxygen with the two lone pairs. The blue lone pairs over here are now sitting as a pi bond that reformed. The red electrons that reached out formed a new bond to this one right here. And we have the carbonyl that got attacked now has just a single bound to oxygen. It had two lone pairs. And now it has a third lone pair with a negative charge. It also has the OCH3. Now this is where the reactions are different. This is the critical, critical step that we have to recognize. Unlike the previous reaction, this carbonyl, uh, this oxygen, the, there's no carbonyl here, but this O minus can reform a carbonyl because if it comes back down, we have a leaving group that can get kicked out. A CH3 O minus can absolutely be kicked out in a solution that is full of CH3 O minus because you're just putting more of the same into solution. And when that happens, we get something that looks like this. We have the CH3 O this carbonyl here hasn't changed. We have the bond to the new group. We have these two. Hold on, I'm missing something. We missed a carbon here. There should have been an extra carbon because we have that methyl group. So we have this methyl group now sitting over here. The single bond to oxygen. But now these electrons are sitting as a pi bond. So do you notice that in the aldol condensation, this stayed as an O minus attacked a proton and became an OH. 
But in this reaction, because we have something that we can kick out, the carbonyl can reform, and that is how we get the beta keto ester. That is the main, main difference with these reactions. Now, technically, this looks like the reaction is done. Some of your professors may accept it as is, but the reaction is, in fact, not done. This is the annoying step. We have alpha hydrogens, and we have more CH3O minus in solution. And so we'll show another CH3O minus in solution that is going to grab one of the alpha hydrogens. The reason it's so easy to grab is I can do resonance in this direction, or I can do resonance in this direction. And that means we have a molecule that wanted to be done. It wanted to be stable, but instead it's now left with a lone pair and a negative charge. I'm going to leave it on the carbon, but it can park in both directions. It can park on either of the carbonyls. So what we do from here is we simply find, actually, okay. so what we do from here is the next step, we do want to acidify the solution. We want to add H3O plus to stop this thing from reacting and reprotonate either this or if it's sitting on here, make the electrons come back down so we can protonate it. And so when this reaches out for a hydrogen, that is when we get the product that we technically already had over here, except we had to work for it. So we thought we were done. We were not done. We do an extra step and now we're done. I know that one was really annoying. Some professors will allow you not to show that, but my professor was very, very detail-oriented and wanted us to show all of this. Now, earlier we had asked about heat. There is actually one more thing that can happen here. If I put a mild acid, I protonate. But if I put this thing into a concentrated acidic solution, the product will once again change. What do you think will happen what kind of reaction will happen if I put a lot, a lot of water and acid into solution? I'm going to get an ester hydrolysis where the ester will get hydrolyzed or broken off and I get a carboxylic acid product. So if I do concentrated acid, I will get an acid product. Square, I'm not sure. I, I'd have to draw that out, but that does sound like it's the same idea. So I love that you have an approach for this. All right, that was tediously annoying. So let me know if you are ready to see the shortcut for this, just like we had for the aldol condensation. And that way, it'll take you a matter of seconds to come up with a product. So let's take a look at what we had before and let's see how things are going to change. The first step is to number the players. So let's grab this right here and let's get rid of the product. So this is the reaction we've already seen, but now we're going to see it come together with a shortcut. Before we had the attacking carbonyl as carbon number one, the alpha carbon of the attacker as number two, and the carbonyl carbon that gets attacked as number three. That hasn't changed. Step two, you draw the V, you number it one, two, and three. That hasn't changed. Then we fill in the groups. Carbon one is unchanged. That's the ester. And so we'll fill it in. And this is an OCH3. Carbon 2 has a new bond to carbon 3. We do nothing. Carbon 3 gets a ketone. That's the difference here. Carbon 3 gets the ketone. That's this one right here because it lost the ester. This is gone. 
and then we fill in the rest. So what is the rest? Nothing on the attacking molecule. The one that got attacked has a methyl group coming off of carbon three. Boom, there's my methyl. The difference here, that little note that we had before, the change here is if concentrated H3O plus, then the product is going to be a carboxylic acid rather than an ester. So all you would do is swap the R group for a hydrogen and you're good to go. All right, take a moment to look at the shortcut and then let me copy it so that we can apply it together to a trickier problem. Oh, let me put it on a new page so that we can see it make it a little smaller. Okay, let's say you're given a molecule that looks like this. If you saw this as a condensation reaction before today's session, would you have considered this easy, medium, or hard? Let me know in the comments. And if you're watching the recording, let me know in the comments below as well. Now that we have the shortcut, let's see if we can make it easier and faster. First thing we're going to do is redraw the molecule because we want to have two that we can mark up. Happens to be, after you do this a couple of times, you won't even have to do it twice. I just tend to go one, two, fill everything in, and then three on the same molecule. I don't draw it twice. But when you're just starting out, take your time. Don't rush it, and do take the time to draw it out. Okay, so let's draw our product here. So we'll draw a V. We'll number it. Uh, let's draw it a little lower so we have plenty of space. Where did I draw it before? Let's put it here. We'll number it one, two, three. I forgot to number this. One, two, and three. And then we fill it in. Carbon one is my ester. This is just an OET. I'm simplifying this because it's an ethyl group. Carbon three is a ketone. That is this, but it lost the ester. And then we fill in the rest. So what is the rest? Carbon two has a CH2 and a ring coming off of it. So that would be a CH2 and a ring coming off of it. Carbon three has two carbons and then a ring coming off of it. So that's one, two, and then the ring. And boom, there's our final product. What do you think? Is this as difficult or easier as you expected before you had the shortcut? All right. So the next reaction I want to look at, I don't know why it has its own name because it's basically just another form of the reaction that we just did. And that is the Dieckmann condensation. I've heard some people pronounce it Dieckmann. I don't actually know which one is the proper pronunciation, but I will show you the reaction. And that's all that matters, right? Being able to solve it. Say I have a molecule that looks like this. One, two, three, four, five, six carbons with an OCH3 ester on this side, a carbonyl, and an OCH3 ester on this side. And we want to react this in NaOH as step one and step two, H3O plus. It looks like a big scary reaction, but if you take a moment to think about it, it's an ester, another ester. The one end of the molecule can go ahead and attack the other end of the molecule. So we can do it the shortcut way or I can show you another way if you're having trouble visualizing it. So first, let me show you how quickly you can solve this once you're comfortable. We randomly pick one side because it's symmetrical to be the attacker. We number it one and two, and then the carbonyl on the other side is carbon number three. Then for the product, we draw the V. 
we number it one, two, three. And this is where it gets a little bit tricky. So let's start first by filling it in. Carbon one gets the carbonyl and the OCH3. Carbon three is just a carbonyl. And now the question is, what else is going on? Between carbons two and three, I have what we can call A, B, and C. I have three carbons connecting two and three. So it goes two, A, B, C, three. Two, A, B, C, three. That looks a little drunk. Let's try that again. A, B, C goes back to three. A, B, C. And boom. I used the same exact shortcut to come up with my product. This is the way I want you to be able to solve this after you've had some practice, after you get really comfortable. But in the beginning, I know students feel overwhelmed by turning this into a ring. And so what I recommend is if you're not comfortable doing what I just did, then I challenge you to first do a redraw and to set it up where your carbonyl is going to very easily be rearranged so that it can attack that carbon over there. And the way that I would do that is first, the ester on the left doesn't move because it's not involved in the reaction. So that is over here. And then I want to line it up in a way that I have two A, B, C, and then carbon three is right there. OCH3 like this. So take a look. This was one, two, A, B, C, three. And when I get this to be negative, that is how the reaction would happen. It goes up, it goes down, gets kicked out. That is where the ring is ultimately going to form. Uh, that yellow is not visible. So let me show it to you in a different color. So if you need to take the extra step to redraw, go ahead and do it this way so that you can clearly visualize where and how the attack is going to happen. But once you get really comfortable, I challenge you to try solving it that way. So let me know in the comments if you're with me so far, because what I'm going to show you next is another favorite for professors. And I wanna make sure that you know how to reverse the reactions. What if you're given a situation where you have a product, but you're missing the reactant, you're not asked for a mechanism, and you need to come up with it very quickly. So for example, say you're given the product that looks like this. You have a benzene ring and attached to that you have an OH. We have a methyl group coming out here and we have an aldehyde over here. What you're going to do here is take the trick that I showed you before and reverse it. So step one, I want you to find your one, two, three. Find one, two, and three in the products. And this is going to be the same one, two, three that we found before. One was the carbonyl that didn't change. Two was the alpha that did the attack. And three was the alcohol or the pi bond if that happened from dehydration. But now that we've found it, what you're going to do is remember that carbon two attacked carbon three because two was the alpha. And so you're going to break the bond between carbon two to carbon three. We'll break that bond right there. And when you redraw your reactants, step three is when you redraw, what you're going to do is carbon three gets the carbonyl. And then everything else is exactly the same. So that means that this reaction here came from something that looked like this. On the right, nothing changed. This is exactly as I see it. So notice I have carbon one, two, and a little tail coming down. That means I'm going to redraw it like this. I have the tail attached to carbons one and two. Carbon one is an aldehyde. That is this portion of the molecule. Then I'm going to grab this portion of the molecule 
And that is exactly as I see the skeleton. So I have a benzene ring. And then the carbon three attached to the benzene ring, except I turn three into an aldehyde because it becomes a carbonyl. And that's it. I reversed the molecule. I reversed the reaction. I have the product. And without having to worry about anything crazy, I immediately just broke it up and found my reactants. Okay, so let's try this for one more. And I want you to let me know in the comments, even if you're watching the recordings, if you saw this reaction or if you saw this product before today's session, would you have considered it easy, medium, or hard? And how do you feel about it now that you have the shortcut? So we have a benzene ring. We have an alcohol. And then we have something that looks like this. Okay, let's see the steps. This came from, well, let's find our numbers. We have one did the attack, two is the attacking carbon, three is the alcohol. Break between two and three, and that is exactly what we have. That right there, my starting molecule, no changes. That means I have this right here. I'm drawing it like this, but technically you could have also drawn it like this. It's just a ketone. And I'm reacting it with this portion of the molecule, which I have to turn into an aldehyde. So the alcohol gets turned into an aldehyde, but the rest I don't have room for. Hang on, let's move everything over. So what do I have? Carbon three is my aldehyde. And attached to it, I have a benzene ring. And that's it. Okay, so these were both aldol condensation. Let's see what happens if we try to reverse a Claisen condensation, because I want you to see how the trick works just as well. We'll just have to change a few things, maybe. If I have a molecule that looks like this, ETO carbonyl, this thing, this thing being an isopropyl, but for the sake of what we're doing today, it's just extra stuff. All right. What do you think? Easy, medium, or hard without the shortcut? For the shortcut, we find one, two, and three. With an ester, remember one was your ester carbonyl, two was the alpha. Three was the ketone, beta keto ester. Three is the ketone. Once again, we break between carbons two and three. We redraw, except in this case, carbon three gets an OR to give me the ester. And so we have the attacker looks like this. That would be my... ETO, carbonyl, and then this thing attached to it is an isopropyl group coming off of carbon two. So that's carbon two, and I have an isopropyl attached, so it's just this chain. Let's move this over so we have room. The second piece is this right here, except we're going to turn carbon three into an ester, and that means we have We'll put it as the same OR group, carbonyl, and attached to it, we have benzene. That's it. These are my two reactants. The only thing that changed in the trick is we had to remember to give it an OR because we started with an ester. Right. For even more practice on this topic, go to layerforsci.com slash or go live, click the button to sign up. The link is also in the pinned comment and you'll get a copy of tonight's session notes, a bonus practice worksheet and a link to this and all the other live stream recordings that I've already done. The link is layerforsci.com slash or go live. For even more help with organic chemistry, because these live streams focus on beginner topics, but I cover all of Organic Chemistry 1 
and organic chemistry too in a lot more detail in my organic chemistry study hall. As a study hall member, you get access to the full Orga 1 and Orga 2 video libraries with beginner videos, advanced videos, meaning more advanced, tricky topics, lots more practice, video solutions to all the practice quizzes on my website. And you also get access to my tutoring and support group where you can post your daily questions, get help, get guidance, and anything you're stuck on, anything that wasn't covered in a video specifically, you'll also get help with as well. So the link to sign up is layerforsci.com slash join. Again, that's layerforsci.com slash join.